me do this. Some of the change you're going to need is education. Some you're going to have to address in terms of time control and discipline and hours you're going to have to work. Some of you have already heard at this meeting, do yourself a favor, teach LUTC advanced course so you'll learn it yourselves. Get back to the basics. Take the CHFC and the CLU so that you're able to go out and say, hey, I know what I'm talking about. Even if you don't sell those products, be able to talk about them. It is going to be inconvenient. There is going to be a temporary disruption in normalcy. You are going to have to work more hours for a while, but you don't make the kind of incomes we've been able to make in the past part time. You're going to have to pay the price. You got to raise your sights, you got to raise your expectations. And in this crazy world, the whole thing is attitude. Totally attitude. Now, two years ago, I was supposed to come to this meeting and have dinner with a fellow from the Bay Area that was doing some joint work with me, needed some help on some big cases. Some of you knew him, his name was Ray Swift. Ray and I had a visit just before the New York meeting. We had dinner together in New York. I mean, in California, and he said, we'll meet in New York at the round table and finish it. I said, you got it. I got to my hotel room in New York, and my phone rang, and there was a call from California. Ray Swift was on the phone. And Ray said, Norman, I am sorry, but there's a minor inconvenience. I can't come to the meeting. I'll see you when you get back. It's rather extraordinary because Ray has been very dedicated to this organization, as some of you know and never missed a meeting, but I said, okay, Ray, I'll see you when we get back. When I got back, I called up Ray and said, what's the problem? He came over to my office and he said, Norman, I told you, I've got a minor inconvenience. I said, what's the minor inconvenience, Ray? He says, well, I wasn't feeling too good, and just before the meeting, I went to a doctor. And when I got to the doctor, I was examined, and the doctor said I had a problem. And he said, no problem, I'll take care of it, but uh, it's going to disrupt things a little bit. I said, what's the problem? He says, well, I've got cancer of the liver and the pancreas. I almost fell out of the chair. As shocking as it was to me, I suspect it was more to him, but you never would have known it. Here was a guy around 37 years old, wife and two young kids, who literally was taking it like he had a hangnail. He never changed his lifestyle. He qualified for the Million Dollar Roundtable the following year. He was out working. He spent time with his church, time with his family. Spoke at Life Underwriter meetings, traveled all around giving back, constantly up, constantly positive, constantly sharing, constantly loving. Extraordinary. Particularly extraordinary in the times because everybody else was bitching and complaining and he was feeling fine. He'd say things, and this is part of what I want to share with you as I conclude this. You know, I don't know what the big fuss is, Norm. God wanted to get my attention. And I'd say, what do you mean by that? And he says, well, maybe I've been too apathetic, too complacent. I was taking my family for granted. I was taking time for granted. I was taking my church for granted. I was taking my business for granted. God was trying to get my attention. So I think I'll give it a little more because I realize God is right. And then he'd say things like uh, when people would get upset with this, and it's no, no surprise. Uh, there'd be people in the room with a hangnail, with nothing, complaining. And they'd want to bring the whole family into the grave with them with the hangnail. I mean, I got trouble. I'm, I, things are tough. And Ray would be sitting there smiling. He'd come in a room, and the room would light up. Some people walk in, the rain came right in with them. <laughs> He said, Norm, you know, I, and he said this to a lot of people, not just me. I don't know what people are so upset about. I win either way. I said, what do you mean you win either way, Ray? He says, well, if I get better, I'm going to be a better man for it. God has gotten my attention, and I will be a better man than I ever was before. And he said, if I die, the pain will stop. And I could never get used to that. It was so extraordinary. I think, God, what would I do in that situation? You know, I've been walking around the halls. This has been the greatest million-dollar roundtable meeting I have ever been to. And I say that every year, but this has been unreal. <laughs> but do you know there are people in this room that have said to me they haven't liked it? And I'm sure everybody's heard one or two say, I can't believe it. I think people would go to the museum in Paris and look at the Mona Lisa and find out what's wrong. <laughs> He'd say, and this one I'd like you to hear, 
people take time for granted. They're talking about 15, 20 years from now. They keep procrastinating, putting things off. Don't people realize the most valuable possession we got is time? And I may only have a year or two, or I may have forever, but use every minute. And I'll go out and ask someone to do some volunteer work in the community, or for a charity, or for this organization, or for NALU, or for anything else. I'm too busy. Talk about love and giving. If you visited Ray in the hospital, even the day he had chemotherapy, even when he was lying there yellow with his eyes sunken in and his weight just peeling off of him and getting thinner and thinner and worse and worse, he'd raise himself out of the bed until the day he died, literally, and offer you coffee and donuts, which he kept at his bedside so that everyone that ever came in would be a comfortable and he'd entertain them right to the moment he died. And he said, you know, Norman, God loves me. And some of you in this room heard him say that. God loves me. And I say, Ray, what do you mean God loves you? If God loves you, why isn't he making you better? And he said, Norman, obvious. He could make me better, but he wants me with him sooner. And there'd only be one reason for that. He's got something for me to do. And he loves me more than he loves some other people. Now, there's a man in this room, I don't know where he's sitting, by the name of Charlie Linden. This is classic round table. Charlie, too, is a big hitter, MDRT. Charlie gave up the last six months of Ray's life for Ray. He became the executor of his estate. He did the final financial planning. He took care of Ray in the hospital. He handled all of his life insurance business, Ray's, not Charlie's. He almost got out of the business himself with love. And Ray, to the day he died, didn't miss a beat because with Charlie at his side when he'd speak at life underwriter meetings and Ray was speaking right to the end telling people what a great world we live in Charlie would be the one that would introduce him. just before Ray died I was in the hospital the day before he died so was Charlie Ray took my hand Charlie heard him say this he said Norman if you ever speak at the million dollar round table would you please tell them my story he said my one dream was to stand on that stage and tell it to them myself but if I don't make it Will you do it? And I promised him I would, which is part of the reason I'm doing this today. The next thing he said to me is, you know, Norman, don't worry about me. I've already done my planning for next week. He said, if I die, I've got my agenda for heaven all worked out. I know exactly what I'm going to do when I get there. And he lapsed into a coma from the morphine and stuff and came back to his senses about an hour later. And I was standing there, and he grabbed my hand, and he said, Norman, forgive me. I know I told you I had an agenda. But with your permission and everyone else's, I'm going to take a vacation when I get to heaven. I need the rest. I'm going to take two weeks and go fishing, and then I'll start my agenda. You can't lie about things like this. That is precise. Now, just before he did die, he did a couple of things. He said, tell the folks I love them. And he picked out his pallbearers, one of whom was me and one of whom was Charlie, and we had the honor of carrying Ray to his final rest. And then he said to his wife, Sherry, who was an absolute doll, and said, Sherry, I don't care what suit you put on me when I get buried, but I want you to promise one thing. When I die, my million-dollar round table pin will be in my lapel, and I'll be buried with that there. <laughs>